And we've got lots of samples up here, so if you ever want to come check stuff, I've even got lots of stuff for my master's thesis, which I didn't talk about, but I'm happy to explain those in person if you want to see them. So happy to take any questions. What are you doing next? It's a great question. I don't know. So I, we're actually going, we're going to Africa for September. And I can't wait to have nothing on my mind except for gorillas. <laughs> but there's, there's definitely a few potentials. So there's some potentials at Google, some potentials at Apple, and there's some potentials for a startup too. So I don't know. I'd love to end up back in academia, but for right now, I just want like a regular job so I can get some sleep on the weekends. Uh, but in, eventually, I'd love to go into academia, I think. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, thanks very much, Steve. I was wondering if you could maybe spend 60 seconds talk about what you see as the nearest term applications. Sure. So I think, uh, are you talking about the digital construction platform or the thesis in general? Um, the thesis in general, I mean, I think the, the most relevant, like, real world situation right now, it would be implementing the Insight Concrete Formwork. So it, when we made that structure on the Google site, there was actually other people coming through because there's some other little Google startups around there. And every time people saw it, almost about 90% of the people had an idea and we had a number of people wanting to pay us to build their custom structures. We had one guy who wanted, who had a, a really famous client who wanted to build an underground basketball court. <laughs> yeah. And he wanted to make all it really crazy and he wanted to use this and he was ready right there to, to sign up for it. So I think that would probably be the most, the fastest thing that we do right away is because we have this technique which we can finish using all these construction ready techniques. So I think that would probably be the most relevant right away. I think in the longer term, this idea of additive fabrication and mapping that data, I think, is the more powerful one. Um, how can we integrate biology into design? How can we design with biology? Uh, I think those are the ideas of living products that will be uh, much more uh, exciting in the future. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, a quick question about the dome. Sure. So when I see the sure. dome, I think of the Pantheon. Yeah. It's a really awesome structure that you chose to go with. Yeah. Knowing like how the Pantheon is built, with the aggregate sizes that get smaller as you uh -huh. go up, the uh -huh. density gets uh -huh. you know finer with more pumice as you go up. Uh -huh. I thought about or like putting yeah. your steps yeah. to find your functionally yeah. graded process with your printing process, yeah. and maybe have a lighter dome. I mean, that is a great question because I didn't have time to fit it in here, and I had to yeah. cut it. <laughs> Uh, so we did a lot of work back in the day on functionally graded concrete so with different densities. So these, for example, if you come up and feel them, are very different weights or different grades of concrete. So one of the ideas, the original basis of this project was to print functionally graded concrete. And the way that we could do that is basically in that mold, we could then deposit the concrete with multiple nozzles. So we, in the middle nozzle could be a low density and the two outer ones could be a high density, just like our bones. So that's one route. The more interesting one because we've already done it is in that dome I didn't talk about this the dome walls actually change in diameter as you go up it's actually an ellipsoid dome so we actually did uh, this is a project with, with the Europe we mathematically modeled the optimum shape that you could make to actually have a structure with the lowest amount of material and it turns out it's an it's an it's a dome with an ellipsoid shaped wall so basically at the very top the wall thickness is zero and so in that, if you actually, if you cut that dome that we printed, you'd see that it starts like this and it actually goes up slightly like this. Um, and that's because, like you said, near the top you don't need the same structural support. Uh, and so that was one of the really neat things about this project, is you could never do that with traditional techniques. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on machines that collaborate with neighbors? Or <laughs> <laughs> perhaps machines that mediate the collaboration between different animals that fabricate on different yeah, that would be great. Uh, I, I don't know about beavers, uh, but I think on the bacteria side for sure. Uh, so for example, a lot of the microfluidic stuff, we were using live cells in there. And the, the Mushtari project was focused around this idea of working with Pamela Silver's lab of basically modifying E. coli to produce sugar, which would feed, or sorry, modifying cyanobacteria, which is a photosynthetic system, it's a photosynthetic organism, to produce sugar, which could feed E. coli. So we made a co-culture of those two species so that basically you could have E. coli that's fed from the sun and E. coli is the workhouse of synthetic biology so we can modify that E. coli to make whatever we wanted to. So for example, with this, the SRT protein that we showed, we could maybe in the future put that into the E. coli and then your solar panels could actually be living solar panels. Instead of electricity, they're actually creating glucose which is powering E. coli to make your materials. 
So I think, I think starting with bacteria is probably the easiest route to go with. Um, there's been other research in our group. Marcus has been working on ants and the silkworms, of course. Uh, so you can definitely look at the larger scale, too. Uh, but I do think that uh, starting with kind of lower level organisms like bacteria gives you a lot more control on the genetic side. Blind allies of things that you thought were a good idea. Yeah, and lots. Yourself, they weren't. You want to you hear about the mistakes? Uh, yeah, there's, lot, there's lots of mistakes. Um, let me see. There's uh, probably the most, one of the more surprising things that we learned from the dome print was how morning dew can actually affect the cure rate of the foam. So we were printing like normal, and it was about 5 a.m. in the morning, and all of a sudden, one layer, I could actually show you a picture if you want to see it, one layer warped like crazy, and it looks like tinsel on a tree. And it was because in that one minute, the morning dew had condensed. It hit that temperature. And that inhibited the cure of things. So what we actually had to do is we mounted a chainsaw to the unit to cut off the top bit to flatten it all out, uh, which is pretty crazy. Let me see if I can find a picture of that. Um, in terms of failed ideas, definitely, definitely no, no shortage of failed ideas. Um, I don't know if I can find that picture. I can definitely look it up. Let me see if I can find it of the twisted foam. But it basically looked like tinsel on a, on a tree. Um, let's see here. And if not, I, I can show it to you after. But basically, that was one of the big lessons that we learned was kind of how environmental conditions can really modify things. Um, I can't find it at the moment, but sorry about that. More about engineering limitations and yeah, sure. like printing buildings. Sure. So things like uh, tolerance stack, yeah. tolerance to the wind, or thermal changes, yeah. as well as feature size. Yeah. So those are all great questions. I mean, one of the major things that we realized in looking at the background research is that none of the large scale printing projects that we've previously seen are, none of them are code certified. None of them have been tested for freeze thaw. None of them have been tested for dynamic loads. Uh, so those are big areas that we really wanted to focus on. Um, and that's why we tried to use this process, which would reduce the amount of, of differences. We don't have layer to layer adhesion problems. We don't have to worry about finishing techniques. Um, for for on-site fabrication, you're absolutely right in terms of environmental properties. I mean, we had to be very careful to make sure it wasn't raining when we were printing. Uh, we were actually able to handle fairly high wind loads. We monitored it with an anemometer, or rather the, a wind gauge, and we printed in three meters per second wind speeds, and it was fine. Uh, so th that's definitely a great point of how do you make it robust enough to be on site, because that's one of the benefits of a factory. Everything's under control. Uh, and we definitely found that little differences in ground height did make a difference. So when we did some of the original prints, uh, the first layers, there were some areas of the ground that were a little wet, and there were some little divots. And we actually could actually see those propagate through the structure. Uh, you'd see that little bump would propagate. And so in, we would, what we learned is we really need to have real-time environmental sensing. It's like a must. Uh, to be able to handle those things because you have environment like what happens if you know a bird comes and sits on it right those are all those are all questions right so uh, I mean I think you're absolutely right but the really exciting part about on-site fabrication is you can make things much bigger so we got interest from Lockheed Martin to make wind turbines on site because a wind turbine is limited in scale by the transport so you can only you know you can only transport such a long size blade tip and they make custom roads for it and stuff what if you could fabricate all on site because wind speed actually increases dramatically as you go up in height, right? So th there's possibilities for on-site fabrication that are totally unique uh, and could be enabled by systems like this. Do you have a sense of your actual feature size? Or actual yeah, we do. We did. Size? So we actually did, uh, I, I cut all these slides out, but we actually did characterization. We did a, 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 an ISO test of it as well. So let me just go down. So here's all the controls for it. And here's how we did actually the characterization of it here. Let me make this screen go a little bigger. So we mounted basically this mirror ball, which is for a Leica, and this is for our external characterization. We actually did this ISO test, which is a test for repeatability. So this is the standard test for these large, for basically a system to get repeatability poses. And we have the five waypoints, and you can see that over time, basically the mean error is around one centimeter to two centimeters. With, with, and you can see the standard deviations there. And that's without the KUKA being actuated. Now, the KUKA actually has an accuracy of about 0.06 millimeters. But of course, it's restricted of what, how good of a sensor we're using. So on there, we had these laser sensors, which have a resolution around one centimeter. So we were roughly around there, around one centimeter. 
Um, we also had a whole variety of other sensors that in the future I would love to implement more additional control. So we didn't really use the accelerometers. We, we were collecting the data, but we didn't really use them in the control loop. We have real-time GPS on there, which is two GPS systems that does this interference situation to get about a two or three centimeter resolution that I would love to in integrate as well. I'd love to do optical monitoring. So definitely uh, there's huge room for growth in improving that. But as you can see by the success of the dome, it was enough because the foam has tolerances that are able to accept that, that we can do it. What are, what are conventional building techniques? You know, they're, they're, they're I don't know. I mean, I think that's a great question. I, I'm, I'm not familiar with traditional construction tolerances. I think they're, I don't actually know. Is anybody know in the audience? Dylan. 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 <laughs> there you go. So you're in the ballpark. There you go. You're in the ballpark. Yep. Yeah. So thanks. A great, uh, great presentation. Um, so you talked about additive manufacturing of, of physical objects. Yeah. That's right. So I was wondering what you could share with us about whether the principles of additive manufacturing apply also to knowledge. Hmm. and to emotions. Could you additively manufacture knowledge? Could you additively hmm. manufacture an emotion? Or is it only restricted to, to the atoms, to the, to the physical domain? I've never thought about that. That was a very interesting question. The answer um, is your own spiders. Just putting it in there. Yeah. Mary, Mary, this is Steve's time to answer. I don't, actually, I don't actually know how we learn. I mean, okay, here's an interesting example. They cut out 10% of my brain. Did that remove knowledge or provide knowledge? Uh, so after, right? I can tell you it definitely rem it added emotions. <laughs> it, it added emotions, that's for sure. I couldn't spell three and four letter words for those first few days after the surgery. It definitely had an effect in that dimension. Um, but I don't know in terms of additive fabrication of, of thoughts. I mean, one concept that I focused on in my, th in my master's thesis was we listed subtractive, additive, and, and formative. I added a fourth dimension in the master's thesis, which was called immaterial. So just like you're saying, what if we fabricate something but not use movement of atoms? What if we fabricate in the electromagnetic space? What if we fabricate in the optical space? What if we fabricate uh, with non-physical objects? And so I described what immaterial fabrication could be for that purposes. Um, and, and I think that's in that kind of area. I haven't focused on, on knowledge of, of brains and stuff, but that's very interesting for sure. All right, well, OK. Yep. Static and dynamic structures. Yes. And yes, the robot moves, but the structures are still static. Right. Have you considered printing functional uh, dynamic moving structures? Yeah. So in terms of the dynamic structures, I think a lot of that will come from some of the bio stuff. So for example, with the fluidics, being able to actively control the valve, being able to actively control the, the biological substances in there through temperature or light. Um, those are, I think, are be the easiest, the, the lowest hanging fruit. So one of the things that we've often thought about, and I actually did some renders and some initial tests on, this is one of those failed ideas that you're asking about, was I tried to make a tubular building. So I looked at, is there a way to deposit tubes so that you could then basically imagine a, a, a lattice network of tubes as a building, and then you could fill a tube with concrete to make a structure. You could fill another tube with wires for electricity. You could fill another tube with bacteria to make, like you said, a dynamic building. Like maybe you could tune that, that E. coli if it senses carbon monoxide to turn pink. So if you're looking around at your walls and your walls turn pink, eh, you get out of the building, right? Uh, or maybe you could actually have it so if it detects a little bit of oxygen, it knows there's a leak and it would actually precipitate material to, to repair it. Um, so I did look at tubular buildings and it was a brutal failure. I tried to make it work. I think you could do it in the future, but it didn't, I didn't have success to start with. Um, I think that's it. Good. Well, thank, thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you.